I believe we're live, so just getting the thumbs up. Okay, so good evening everybody. This is the P2 live stream, exam revision. Um, I am Mr. Pritchard. I'm going to be starting the P2 revision, and when we get to electric motors, I'll be handing it over to Mr. Cave, who's going to clue up anything that um, he feels is going to be important to also add. So, I did add a Mr. Cave famous pun here, so providing momentum to get through the final exam. I know he, he's going to enjoy that one. So, what I'm going to start off with, actually I should start the timer. So, a little overview about uh, forces, and then we're going to get into things like speed and acceleration, then I'll, then I'll connect it all together for you. So, a force is either a push or a pull. Um, and when any two objects uh, interact, they exert a force uh, equal and opposite um, on each other. So if forces are balanced, so if the two forces are balanced, then there's not going to be any motion. It's when there's an unbalanced force is where you're going to get that movement. We're going to touch on that a bit um, as we go through. So the first thing after this that we'll talk about is uh, speed and velocity. Okay, so speed is how fast an object is traveling. And velocity is um, how fast an object is traveling in a certain direction. Okay, so velocity is just speed with a direction. Um, the equation that you're going to use for this, um, I believe this one will be given, uh, is speed, or no, it won't actually, is speed equals distance over time. <laughs> I got thumbs up for that one as well. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> So just like any equation, if they do give you something where you've got to calculate the speed, it will probably be so you have to use it um, in a two-part or three-part equation. They'll give you two of these three values. You just have to find, it, uh, find the third. Um, what they're really you're probably going to see is something like this, and it's called a distance time graph. Um, and you can calculate speed from a distance time graph, and it's important that you, when a graph comes up, Keep note of what's written on the axis, okay? Because we're going to talk about a velocity time graph as well, and a lot of students get them mixed up on what the lines actually mean on each. So on a distance time graph, if we have uniform motion at a fast, steady speed, you will see this straight line going straight up. Um, so this is telling us that distance is increasing over a set amount of time, okay? So time keeps ticking and distance is increasing. Now if you look here at this red line, I'm not sure if you can see it, if there's a glare or not, but we have this steady speed, so the line's going up straight, and we get this get increasing, and we get this flat horizontal line coming here now. So on a distance time graph, what that means is distance is no longer increasing. Okay, so distance is no longer increasing, but you know time is still ticking by. So what that can tell us is, this object now is motionless, okay? it's stationary, it's no longer making any distance. As we come along, you watch, the line starts to return to start. So what that tells us is it's actually going backwards, so we're going back to start because the distance is now decreasing. Okay, so what you might also show is if you get a curved line, Okay, it's still telling the same thing, okay, it is getting faster, but this can tell us on a distance time graph that there's going to be some acceleration. So, distance is increasing, but also the time at which it's increasing is getting shorter, so that means the object is getting faster, we're getting some acceleration happening. So, the next one, talking about acceleration, which I just mentioned, is acceleration equals the change in velocity over a time taken. So, just to switch back, we would have to find out the change in the actual velocity over a set amount of time um, to find out how much it's actually accelerating. So, when the velocity of an object is increasing, it is accelerating. Uh, if the velocity of an object is decreasing, uh, you can say deceleration, uh, decelerating or the acceleration is negative. Now, what's also interesting is an object can be remain at constant speed but if it also changes direction, that's also acceleration. So that's important for you to know. So an object, if I just walk in a circle here at the same speed, I'm actually accelerating because I'm turning as well. So because velocity is speed with a direction. So if you change the speed or you change the direction, you are accelerating. 
And that's why we get onto these velocity time graphs. Now, this is where the confusion, I'm going to try and clear it up so you don't mix up a distance time graph and a velocity time graph. So once again, take note, when you look at these graphs, make sure you read the titles on the axes so you know which kind of graph you're analyzing at the time. So constant acceleration, much like constant speed, is this straight line. It'll be straight. That means you're having a constant acceleration. Um, once the line goes horizontal now, I know many of you are going to have the urge to say that the object's now motionless, but that's not the case. What this means now is it's reached a certain velocity, which in this case it's 8 meters per second. It's now consistent, consistently traveling at 8 meters per second over this many, to, over this many seconds. So it's staying at 8 meters per second. It's not stopping. Um, then, when we get the line back, it's actually not, it's also not going back, it's not returning. What it's doing is it's decelerating, it's slowing down. Um, well that's it, it's just slowing down. I don't know what else to say about that. So, the common mistake I always see when I'm correcting this is make sure you read the axes, know which graph is which, know which one we're talking about so you don't fall into those traps of saying that this is motionless. And this means returning to start. A few more things. Okay. Are we back? I'm giving yeah. a thumbs up that we're back. Just met some technical difficulties. I'm just going to backtrack a little bit because I don't know what we missed or what we didn't miss. Finished describing the velocity time graph. Um, I was getting into how we can actually calculate acceleration from looking at this graph. And that's by getting the slope. Okay, so slope of the line. I picked the point, so I got this far before I realized we were off. I picked the point here at uh, two seconds. Um, there's an increase in meters, um, the meters per second was at four. So the change was from zero to four. So the change in velocity was four seconds divided by two. And the acceleration is going to be two meters per second squared. Okay, so this is the units for acceleration, it's meters per second squared. So that's the way you can do it. You can do it for many points on this line, but yeah. So that's the, that's the first example I'll show you. I'll be doing a couple more examples this time of the equations as I go through. So that's velocity time graph. Now, calculations of motion. All right, so we're gonna talk about uniform motion and I'm getting, gonna go into something that may come up is vertical motion, okay? So I'll stand over here for this one. If you can see, now this is where a lot of people, uh, students get confused as well, because in this case, when we're doing uniform motion, um, the little x actually means displacement. All right, don't get angry about it, just accept it, okay? Yeah, maybe it should be a little d or, or whatever, but it is the little s, okay? So it's in meters. Uh, U stands for initial velocity, that's in meters per second. The V is the final velocity, and then once A is acceleration, which we just learned how to calculate. So it could be a part where you calculate acceleration, and then you move it into this equation coming up. So the, for uniform motion, okay, um, we have something like this. Okay, so I created a question at the bottom for us to, to work through. And what we have is the final velocity squared, Okay, is equal to initial velocity squared plus, sorry, plus two times acceleration times displacement. And what that looks like. Let's just say what I have here, a car accelerates from eight meters per second at 2.5 meters per second squared for the next 11 meters. That sounds kind of wordy, but don't worry. You just break it down piece by piece and fill in the information that you have. So we need to find out what is, it, what is its final velocity in uniform motion? So we have this equation for uniform motion. Um, I was reminded, what is this one given? Uniform motion? This one will be given on your exam. Okay? So you don't have to memorize it, you just have to be familiar with it. So car accelerates from eight meters. So the first thing I'm gonna write is we need to find final velocity, so I don't have that yet. So I'll leave that as b squared. Next thing I can look for, is the initial velocity, um, and that's going to be squared. An initial velocity that it tells us is 8 meters per second. So, eight, 
So I just fill in that. So the next thing I can try and look for is the acceleration. And the acceleration in this case, we've got 2, it's going to be times 2.5. And then the displacement is 11. Okay, so it traveled uh, for the next 11 meters, so its displacement was 11 meters. Okay, so this is where we are at this point. So just like Sir said in previous times, I'm doing this mental mass on camera, so let's see how it works out. Um, 2 times 2 is 5, so that's 55. V squared will equal. So we get this far, and we gotta find one last thing we need to do is what I'll do is I'll square both sides, and that gets our final velocity on its own. Square root of 119. It's going to be 11 something, maybe? 10.9. 10.9, alright. 10.9. So that's how we would answer that, and it's going to be in meters per second. That's final velocity. So that is uniform motion. Now, what also could, they could talk about is vertical motion, okay? So vertical motion, let's see if I can stand out of the way for a sec here. There's no air resistance, okay? So gravity gives a falling object an acceleration of approximately 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. So that's gravity. That's the acceleration of gravity when it's pulling an object down towards Earth. So we can say that if I throw an object upwards, straight upwards that is, um, it's going to decelerate at minus 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, so when it's coming towards the Earth, it's positive acceleration. But if we throw it against gravity, it's going to be minus 9.8. So the question I'm going to work out for you guys now is, a ball is thrown vertically upwards at 16 meters per second. And if we ignore air, air resistance, it's going to take uh, not at minus 9.8 meters per second squared. It's going to be acceleration. Now, how we can get its final velocity, you have to think, if I throw it straight up, when it hits its highest point, the velocity at that point is going to be zero, because it's going to be motionless very, even if for just for a second, it's going to be motionless at the, at the peak of my throw, which I can throw really far, I can probably hit. Right, go. Okay, getting the thumbs up again, we are having some technical difficulties, I think, around there, so now I'm going to backtrack again. I'm going to be really good at this by the time I finish <laughs> repeating everything over. Um, I'm not sure where I left off, um, so I'm just going to describe this very quickly again. Okay, so we're talking about vertical motion now. So much like uniform motion, I'm doing uniform motion, except I'm now throwing upwards, and it's going to be against gravity. So gravity always gives an object, or makes an object accelerate, at 9.8 meters per second squared, and that's down. So that's down towards the Earth. So if we think about it, if I throw it straight up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to decelerate. It's going to be minus 9.8 meters per second squared because I'm going against the gravity as it goes up. So they sometimes give you a question where you have to find out the maximum possible height um, an object is going to be thrown up. And it's going to give you some of the um, variables to use. So at the top of the throw, just think about it, if I throw up as far as I could, and I the top of its throw, very momentarily, it's going to be motionless. When it gets to the peak of um, how far I threw it, it'll be motionless. So we know the velocity, the final velocity at the top, is going to be zero. Um, so the question that could be asked is, um, what would be the maximum distance that it reaches? And we could do it the same. Okay, We can use the same equation that we used before. Uh, this one here. Okay, so for uniform motion, what we can fill in right away, this time we have the final velocity. So the final velocity, like we said at the top of the throw, okay, is going to be zero. Um, then we start filling in the pieces that we had. So let's just say, um, if I threw it I don't even know which one I'm using. 10? Yeah, okay. Not through it, 10 meters. 10 meters per second. 10 meters per second. That'll be squared in. Um, that'll be plus. So we'll work from there. Um, so 
do the next step already. The acceleration would be minus 9.8, and we are actually going to be looking for displacement. So I'll just leave that as a little x. And so we can go through the next step. Maybe 0 equals 100 plus uh, minus 19.6. <laughs> <laughs> Minus 19.6 S. And that's going to work out to be uh, 0 equals 100 minus 19.6 is 80.4. You want to take the 19.6 X, X over to the other side. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. That's what I gotta do. Thank you for that. So we're gonna take the 19.6x over to the other side, right? Sorry about that. So you take 19.6x over to the other side. There we go. Now I got it. And then displacement is gonna equal 100 divided by 19.6. 5.1. So total displacement is 5.1 meters. So, apparently I'm a very weak thrower if I can only throw it up 5.1 meters. So that's, that's vertical motion. So, it's not, like I said, it's the same thing. It's going to give you um, probably the velocity or um, the acceleration. Yeah, no, the velocity. Okay. Are we back? Yep, you're back. All right. Welcome back again for part four. <laughs> 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 this is the segment. Um, yeah, so I was informed that we did get this calculation in. Okay, so to be fair, most things where you use the equations, I often say this to my students, really they're all the same. They're going to give you uh, different variables. You just got to find the missing variable every time. It's the same thing, same thing. So just try not to get caught up so much in the big blurbs they might give you. Just pick out the pieces that you need, plug it in, get your answer. You'll even get marks sometimes just for writing down your steps too, so do that, okay? Get a clearer piece ready to go here. So, weight and mass, weight and mass, they're not the same thing, okay? So, weight is uh, a force. It's actually how much the force of gravity is acting on an object. Mass is all the matter or, or all the pe or particles, everything that makes up an object. It's what, it's what makes me uh, what I am. So, my mass will be the same no matter where I am in the universe. Okay, so no matter where I am, if I'm out by Pluto, my mass stays the same. If I'm in some other galaxy, my mass is always the same. However, my weight will change depending on the gravity that acts on me. So I'll weigh much less on the moon. I believe gravity on the moon is only 1.6 around there, roughly. So I, I weigh much le more on the moon. So I was really considering of putting out that big weight loss plan to everyone, trying to sell them trips to the moon. Quick way to lose that weight. Very easy. Uh, so, weight is equal to the mass in kilograms times whatever the gravitational field strength is. Now, we talked about gravity on Earth here is 9.8. Sometimes in the question, they'll actually say, they'll give you um, whatever the gravity is. So, if they tell you you're somewhere else on Mars or Moon, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you what the gravity is. For Earth, um, it's 9.8. So, just use that. Some, I, I'm often seeing, I, I have seen other questions where they said Earth is 10. But to be safe, just go with 9.8 unless they tell you otherwise. So, the reason why we talk about motion and forces is that they connect, okay? They're all linking. And the fact of the matter is, there, there is no motion unless a force acts on an object. If I take this marker pen and I laid it here, and if I could stand here for eternity, this flip chart marker would never move unless a force acting on it. Likewise, if an object is already moving, so if I'm already moving, I will never stop unless a force acts on me. Often in space you hear people say, well if I threw something in space would it go on forever? Barring it doesn't come in contact with any large masses that has gravity on it to pull it, yeah, it would go forever unless a force acts on it. Because there would be no air resistance, no forces like that, no friction. So, yeah. 
Um, so the result of all forces on an object, that's called the resultant force. And you might often see diagrams. I'm just going to draw a block, and I'll say there's a force of 150 newtons pushing that way, and we'll give a force of 200 newtons this way. So the resultant force of this one diagram here, you see, we have a difference of 50 newtons, and it's going to go that way. So that would be the resultant force would be 50 newtons that way. So that's a reverse, uh, resultant force. So it's important that we talk about that because force is mass. We talk about mass. We know what that is. And it's force is mass times acceleration. And that's what a force is. Now we know what acceleration is. We know what the mass is. So we can talk about this. Now if we look at this sky diver here. When he first jumps out of the plane, okay, the only force at first, that's, that's most mainly acting on him at this point, is gravity. Okay, so there's nothing acting against him, so it's an unbalanced force, therefore he's going to move towards the ground, and he's going to continuously pick up speed. So he's going to accelerate uh, as gravity acts on him. Now, interestingly enough, as he starts to fall, the air okay, is made up of millions and millions of particles, it's going to start hitting him now, this way. It's going to start hitting him and pushing him back. And that is drag. That's what drag actually is. So all these particles in the air are hitting this guy. So we're starting to pick up some drag. Now, in this case, it's still a resultant force of, six, of 500 newtons down. Because we got drag of 100 newtons up. I'm not sure if you can see it, but hopefully you have the slides up and you can see what I'm talking about. So at this point, it's still accelerating, but he's probably going to start to decelerate a little bit at this point. We have some drag. Now, once he gets to a certain point, these air particles are hitting him and hitting him. Eventually, it balances out so that the drag equals okay, the amount of gravity that's pulling down. So 600 newtons of force is pushing up. That's the drag. And you have 600 newtons of weight. So that's the gravity pulling down. And at this point, this diver has reached its terminal velocity. Okay, So it's going to fall at a constant speed. Again. Back again? All right. Maybe I'll start trying to tell a new joke each time I come back. <laughs> so you'll be waiting to hear what it is. All right, so I believe I got through, got first here, where I said um, he starts to pick up drag because the air particles are now hitting him as he's falling down. At this point, enough air particles is hitting him to match the pull of gravity that's pulling him down. So now we have a balanced set of forces, 600 newtons pulling down, 600 newtons pushing up with the drag. So it's balanced, he's falling at a constant steady speed now. That's his terminal velocity. He'll stay at that speed now uh, for the rest of the way. If he just wants to smack into the ground. So what's going to happen eventually is he will then pull his parachute and it opens up. And what we'll watch is... Gravity won't change, okay? That's still going to be 600 newtons that's pulling them down, but you're, you're going to get much more drag now as he increases surface area to catch more air particles as he comes down. And that's why he's going to slow down. And eventually, it'll match again, okay? Um, and you'll get terminal velocity as the parachute is open, and he'll fall nice and safely to the ground. Uh, so once again, this is just a slide, actually I went a little far ahead. So the maximum speed an ob object can reach when falling is its terminal velocity. So that would be the definition of that. Okay, so we got some re like required practical here. Okay, so required practical, we're trying to uh, measure acceleration different ways. Some of you might have seen this, you might have light gates. I believe some of you didn't have this equipment. Some you, you could do it by building ramps and putting weight on the car and have it uh, roll down. But a couple of ways you can do it is you keep the mass on the car the same and you would change the different forces or you can keep the force constant and, and change the weight that you actually put on the car. And what's going to happen is it pulls down and the car is going to, this light gate is going to measure when it enters and then this light gate will actually record the time it takes for it to get through both gates. Um, questions they might ask you on this, 
It might give you some data, it might get you to draw a graph, um, and you'll actually plot acceleration on a graph. I'm not sure what are types of things they would ask you, but yeah, so be familiar with this. Be familiar with this practical measure and acceleration. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, sir, if you have something to add on that one, what could I ask you on that? Essentially, be the data. Yeah, require practical, they can ask about improvements to the methods. Oh, yeah, so improvements to uh, methods, exactly. Yeah, so let's pretend I didn't have light gates and I was actually, I just had two points and I was trying to measure it with a stopwatch. Okay, one of the improvements we could say is maybe we could get these light gates and it'd be more of an accurate representation of when the car enters the point and where it exits. Um, that's one thing we could do. Yeah, so just have to wait and see. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is momentum. Okay, so momentum is the tendency of an object to keep moving in the same direction. So the thing I always like to talk about when it comes to momentum and inertia is the word I'm looking for. Do you ever be standing on a bus or even on the train and it's going super fast and you're just holding? When the bus or train stops, you always you get that motion forward. Okay, because your, your body's in motion, and when the bus or train stops, it wants to keep going. So that's the momentum that you're going to carry forward with. So it, in order to measure momentum, uh, you need mass, okay, and you need the velocity. And it comes out to be P equals M times V. I'm going to use a different color for that. So P equals MV. So it's mass times velocity. So in a closed system, okay, so the total momentum before an event is always equal to the mo momentum at the end. So it doesn't disappear, it's conserved, okay, it's called conservation of momentum. I like to think of it when I, I think of pool or billiards over here. Uh, if object gains momentum from a collision, the other object must lose the same amount of momentum. So if I was to shoot a pool ball, you must have done it before, and it goes, it hits another pool ball, Sometimes this pool ball can stop dead in its tracks and the other pool ball flies off. What's actually happening is the momentum that was in this pool ball has transferred into the other pool ball, the exact same. So if you record it, the momentum from this pool, pool ball as it hit that one, it would equal the momentum in the other pool ball that sailed off. Likewise, if you shot a pool ball and it hit another one and the boat went different directions, some of the momentum from this pool ball would transfer into the other pool ball. And then it would be equal, the same amount of momentum we started with, these two pole balls would now be sharing that momentum. So it would transfer into the two of them. And we are going to do an equation. Um, we'll get a slide about explosions acting. So explosions are actually a good example of momentum and conservation momentum. Because when two objects push each other apart, they also move apart. So I always like to think about if you're in space as well, and I wanted to throw Mr. Cave a hammer, you would think I could just do that and the hammer would flow towards him, but because of momentum, as I threw the hammer forward, I would actually also start moving backwards at the same time. And a common question, they like to talk about this red skateboarder down here, all you kids today, you're skateboarding, okay? <laughs> so there's laughing at me now. Um, it's hard to see if you got the slides, hope it's up, but I'm going to put, I'm going to write the values up here and I'm going to do it, okay? So the mass of the skateboard is 1.8 kilograms. So skateboard, the mass of the skateboard uh, is 1.8 kilograms. Um, and the mass of the skateboarder is 42 kilograms. The skateboarder himself is 42 kilograms. And what the question reads, if you have the slides up in front of you, just fine. I know you can't read that, it's super small. Calculate the velocity at which the skateboard moves backwards if the skateboarder jumps forwards at a velocity of 0.3 meters per second. So the skateboarder is now going to jump forwards 0.3 meters per second. And we're going to use the equation from the physics equation sheet. Um, I actually learned this from Mr. Cave himself, and he told me mv equals minus mv. So that's what we're going to show you. Um, so mv equals minus mv. So I'll fill in now these things that I have. 
I'm gonna fill it in um, and find the one that I don't have yet. So let's go. So mass. I don't know why I didn't put my cube. 42 kilograms times velocity, 0 0.3. And that's going to equal mass of the skateboard, 1.8 V. Okay, so that's the step we'd be at at this point. Uh, what we then get, oh, come on. 42 times 0 0.3 is 12.6 equals minus 1.8 V and then you're going to get I don't know if I can fit it here for 12.6 over 1.8 and that equals uh, 7 so it's going to be minus 7 so that would be the momentum of the skateboard flying away from this really cool skateboarder doesn't look like it has very good form to be honest so all this information can lead into uh, keeping safe on the road. Okay? This is a big section. They like to talk about thinking distance, braking distance, and then those together actually equals your total stopping distance. So thinking distance is the distance traveled during uh, your reaction time. So in Canada, quite often, we're in Newfoundland where I'm from, lots of moose. I could be driving down the highway, um, see a moose. As it's registering, as I'm reacting to it, oh my god, there's a moose on the road. It's the time it takes between me seeing that moose and me taking action, which would be probably slamming on my brakes. That's my thinking distance. Okay, so I see the moose, then I react, that would be my thinking distance. The braking distance is then the distance traveled. After I press the brake, the distance the car would still travel. Uh, before it stops after I apply the brakes. That's braking distance. You add both of them together and you get stopping distance. All right, so sometimes it's gonna ask you about uh, factors that's gonna affect each. So if you think um, things that factors affect stopping distance, like thinking distance, it could be things like you're tired, uh, you're under the influence of drugs and alcohol, so your thinking distance, your um, thinking time will be way off. You could be on the cell phones, distracted, uh, that would be a reaction time. And then more physical things, things that could stop your braking time would be the roads wet or icy. So you would actually, there'd be less friction, you'd slide more. You could have poor brakes, they're wore down, you didn't get them inspected much. Or if you're actually driving really fast, so the faster you drive, uh, the more it'll increase your braking distance. You add them together, that's how you get your stopping distance. And from what I normally notice is they do ask you that's the kind of questions they'll ask you about this. They'll give you a scenario. And you just, if you have your information of thinking distance and braking distance equals stopping, it's the same thing. It's another equation like anything else. They might give you, um, if, if Jimmy had a thinking distance of this many seconds uh, or of this many meters um, and his total stopping distance was 80 meters, okay, you just find braking distance. You just work your way back and find that. They might even give you some scenario where they say that marijuana decreases reaction time by six seconds. Like it could be anything like that. Just read the question, don't get caught up, just actually apply this knowledge that you have to answer that question. <coughs> Alright, I think we're doing good for time at this point. And we're still online. Alright, <laughs> okay. So another thing that continues on from this unit is actually forces and energy in springs. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen this practical where you've done Hooke's Law, the Hooke's Law lab. So you have this clamp, you set up your meter stick, you got your spring and you'll hang a known mass and then you start measuring the extension each time as you add the mass. What we have here is force equals the spring constant times the extension. So F of force, K is spring constant, E is extension, that should be a lowercase e. Now I'm mad at myself. The whole thing is ruined. Um, so often, um, it's a required practical, and they might give you some data. Okay, so I got this graph. I, I done up this graph that you can look at, and on the bottom it has the weight in newtons. So this is the weight that we add each time to the spring, and in this case it's going up by 0 0.5. 
1.42. And right here we have the extension. Now the extension is in centimeters. All right, so I want you to pay close attention to what they're saying there. It's in centimeters. So in the end, you've got to see what we might have to do. So what it says, state the extension beyond which the limit of proportionality is exceeded. Now if I'm looking at this graph, I need to find out when the limit of proportionality is succeeded, exceeded. Now, even if I didn't know really what that means, it's asking me for a spot where a limit is exceeded. I can look at this and be like, well, it seems pretty straightforward to me. Oh, wait, what happened here? Why did the line all of a sudden like, get steeper at that point? I would probably assume that the limit of proportionality stops right here, and that's at an extension of 8 centimeters. Okay, so if you all see how I did that, I went up and finally the line just shoots straight up. That would be where the limit of proportionality of this particular spring has been exceeded. Next part of the question they might ask you, these are some exam type questions by the way that I did look up, is state the formula linking force, extension, and spring constant, okay, which we just talked about. Force, spring constant, and extension. Now, calculate the spring constant of the spring. Okay, and give your an answer in Newton meters. Oh no, our graph is in centimeters. Whatever are we to do? So, if we look at this, F equals KE, and we start to fill in um, the things that we know. So, I'm going to go right to where the limit of proportionality is. Okay, and I'm going to take that force in Newtons. So we'll start with 2, so that's the force, so all I did, I just took the force from here, right to where it finally stretched its furthest, and I picked 2, 2 newtons, so that goes, fills in for my F for force. Now, spring constant, it wants me to calculate the spring constant, so I don't have that yet. Don't have that yet, so I'll put K, and right there, the extension at 2 newtons, the force was, like we said, was 8. So I'm going to fill in 8, right there. And we would go forward. So, 2, 8, it's K. Okay. So, they're not going to want you to stop here, even though, technically, this is now your spring constant. You want to put it in a decimal. And what this is, is... So K equals 0 0.25 um, newton centimeters. But now, what did the question ask me? Question wants it in newton meters. So how would we do that? There's a hundred centimeters in a, in a meter. So I don't know how you've done it in mass, but I know growing up, I would just move my decimal place over two two zeros, and we would have K equals 25 um, newton meters. Just looking around at other people in the room, sir, my math checks out, <laughs> I think it works. Yeah? I would convert it at person here at the eight stage. Or you can, sir says he would convert it here at the eight stage. I would change that to newtons. Okay. So I would do eight divided by 100 equals 0.8. Okay. So you might write that up on the eight centimeters divided by 100 equals 0.8. So either way, whatever's more comfortable for you, whatever you've been um, taught. Now there is one more part, okay, one more part to this question that they might bring up because I've looked at some past questions, I was looking at some filler things in the book. Um, calculate the amount of energy stored as elastic potential energy when the spring has one newton of force applied to it. So we can do this. Now elastic potential energy equation is something you would have seen in P1, but like Sir said, they like to do that. They might like to carry some things forward and test you on it again. So. What we can do, um, so that's the 
Potential. Really crazy. Um, is that one? That one's given. Is it not? Uh, yeah. yeah, that one's given as well. So, times and. What was the question I asked you? Yeah, eight, one, three. So, four. Mm -hmm. the question first. Right. And it's half times. No, it's like half times. So half times spring constant times extension squared. We worked out the spring constant earlier, which we found out was 25. So we can continue off by saying 0 0.5 times, fill in our spring constant, 25. And the extension squared, there's the key. It's asking at one newton of force. So I would go to one newton of force, go off and at one newton of force, uh, the extension was four centimeters. But we gotta be careful. Okay, you need to put it in meters, so four centimeters, we convert it back to not 0 0.04, and then we go from there, and we would get, um, I did have it worked out here, uh, 0 0.5 times 25 times 0 0.0016. And that works out to be a final answer of 0 0.02 joules. And that's how we just calculated the amount of energy stored um, when the spring has one newton of force. So that was a two part question. You found the spring constant first, then you applied it to another equation, and you worked your way from there. Alright, still with me? Excellent. Now we're going to move on to properties of waves. Okay, so it's the next unit. We talk about properties of waves. Um, and I do got a few notes here to talk to you about this. So waves are vibrations, and they're, they transfer energy from one place to another. Okay, so that's what a wave does. It transfers energy. They come in two types. We have longitudinal. So I was just waving. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he was just waiting. Apologies. I'm, yeah, I was pretty thick on that. Please apologies. Okay, so apologies. <laughs> Again, technical difficulties. We will get through it. Um, yeah, probably giving you a chance to go grab a drink, water, <laughs> or a cup of tea. Nice cup of tea. <laughs> so, long, okay, let's talk about properties of waves. Um, sorry, I got me all messed up. So we have longitudinal and transverse, apologies. So longitudinal, the oscillations or the vibrations in a longitudinal wave, they actually travel um, the same direction as the direction of travel of the wave itself. Okay, so I like to think about maybe a slinky or a spring, and I would I don't know how to do this the best. So a slinky or a spring, and I would push it this way, and the oscillation is actually going to move that way down the spring. So the same direction as the, as the force I applied to it. So I push it that way, the wave's also going to go that way, towards the way the direction is going. Um, sound waves, the reason you can hear me now is I talk and the particles in the air, they vibrate and the oscillations go towards obviously the microphone on the camera and you can hear me speak. Transverse waves, however, the oscillations are perpendicular to the motion of travel. So per perpendicular just means 9 degrees up and down. So if I sent the wave that way, it would actually go up and down perpendicular to the motion of travel. And it looks more like this. And let's say the motion of travel is that way. Yeah. Up and down. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, apologies once again. We keep rolling here. Don't worry, my spirits are still high. Hope yours are as well. Uh, I just started, I drew this wave showing you a transverse wave. I started to label it. Um, they might get you to label the wave, I'm not sure. It could possibly come up. So, amplitude is the height of the peak. Um, this would be the crest up here. So, it would be the height of in here. Now, be careful, don't include. 
all of it, okay, so it's generally a line like this, you just start here, it's just the peak part of here, okay, or this here, I'm going to come through by measuring this one down here instead, it's up to you, it doesn't matter, um, down here would be trough, and then of course you got a full wavelength, which you just pick one full, I like to say one full S, that's how I do it, some people like to go peak to peak, um, but I like to do it like that. That's one full complete wavelength there. And then if they ask you to count how many is passing, right now I have two full wavelengths, as you can see. One, two. But this has two full wavelengths. So maybe I could say, before I teach you it, it's going to have maybe a frequency of two, as it pass, two hertz as it passes a, a particular point. Um, so the equation is velocity of a wave is frequency times wavelength. Now I do touch on this again in a minute, so don't worry. Uh, measuring wave speeds, there's numerous ways we can do wave speeds. This is the one that came up. I've seen it in the book as well, so I'm making sure I go over with you. It was like a little blurb. Um, they got a person that was about 50 meters from a wall, and they would clap, and they would wait until the echo came back. And every time the echo came back, they would clap. So someone actually counted it to 100 claps, so, and they were timing how long it took to do those 100 claps. So let's just say it took 40 seconds to do the uh, 100 claps. So 40 seconds for 100 claps, we need to find out you know, how many claps that is per second. So 40 claps for 140 seconds, 100 claps. So that works out to be 0.4. Um, seconds per clap. Then you could just do uh, speed, the speed equation, which if you all remember, speed equals distance over time. Now, this is interesting, if this comes up, you have to understand what the distance is going to be, because this is an echo. So he's 50 meters from the wall, but how far did it actually travel? It's going to be a total of 100 meters in total, because it's an echo. It went and it came back. So the distance would be 100, the time, the total time it took, 0 0.4 seconds per clap, uh, and that equals 250 uh, meters per second. That would be the speed of that uh, wave in air. So that's just one way um, they might do that. Also, there's a required practical, okay, uh, where you might have seen this ripple tank, where we can actually measure the speed of waves in water, um, and you can see it visually. So wave speed, I got here again, is frequency times wavelength. I'm running out of space. Don't like that at all, sorry. Same thing as frequency times wavelength. Um, where the wave speed is going to be measured in meters per second, so it's speed. Frequency is in hertz, and your wavelength is in meters. Now, a couple of ways you can do it is you got this ripple tank, and your uh, this motor here is going to start a constant force that's going to send the ripples down the water. Now, down here you have this light shining down, and you can have a screen that's going to show you the wave patterns. It's going to look like shadows or even dark lines. And what you could do is you could either mark two points on the ripple tank itself and see how long it takes a wavelength to travel from one point to the next, in which case then you could use distance over time, speed, so the wave. Or you could measure the distance between two dark shadows that you'll see down here. That would be your wavelength. So then you can find wave speed. You can use this equation, this frequency type wavelength. So that's one way, that's how you can use the ripple tank. So this is a, um, not a required practical, you might want to familiarize yourself if you haven't, um, if you don't remember doing it, hopefully you do. It's, it's quite a fun practical to be honest. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if Mr. Katie Owen wants any other questions they might ask using this ripple tank. I think they would try and get you to calculate. They'll probably give you data and get you to analyze it, maybe graph, that kind of stuff. 
We're mostly for practical stuff. The only thing that comes to mind for me is evaluating what would be difficult about making the readings on that experiment. So talking about how it would be hard to measure the distance between the shadows, yep. how it would be hard to time uh, how long one wave took to pass, uh, there would be errors within that. And they could talk about that. Okay, for, if you couldn't hear him off screen that well, he was talking about they might look for the errors. And that's how difficult it would actually be to measure in between some of these shadows. Um, and actually how difficult it would be to accurately... Um, follow a wave and measure the time it took to get between two points. So it's going to ask probably for some errors. It might give you some data to analyze and talk about it. So um, yeah, and it just might actually get you to calculate. It might give you some data and get you to calculate wave speed by using this practice as well. So just be wary of that. Um, next thing about waves is reflection. Okay, so. Reflection, some energy is reflected, some is absorbed, and some is transmitted. So with waves, it's quite interesting. If you think about a shop window, it's actually the very reason why you can see yourself in it, but yet you can see through it at the same time. Okay, so some of that light's being reflected, so you can see your reflection. Some of it is transmitting straight through, so you can actually see through the window itself. Now, the window is also going to absorb some of that light um, as well. Now, if you look... You got an angle, the angle that the light okay, is going to hit the mirror, that would be the angle of incidence. So as it's traveling in towards the object, that's the angle of incidence. And then you have your angle of reflection. Okay? This line down the middle, that's called the normal line. So that's the point where the angle of incidence first hits the mirror. You draw your perpendicular line out from that, and that is your normal line. Your angle of incidence will equal the angle of reflection. I'm sure you've all um, done this and play with flashlights on lights and lasers and whatnot. Um, even think about, once again, when I've done the pool uh, example earlier. If you know your angles and the way it's going to reflect off the sides, it's the same kind of thing. Now, it's not just reflection. It's also, uh, we do a thing called refraction. And what refraction is, um, a wave changes direction when it enters a different medium. So a different substance or a different medium, the wave itself is going to change direction. All right? And if the object, so in this case it's air, so we're going through air, it's going to go through glass. The glass is more dense, okay? So the wave is going to slow down. The light's going to slow down and change its angle as it comes in. Now as it exit, so it emerges, it'll speed back up again so as it speeds through air. And you'll notice that it will be completely parallel to the incident ray. You should have this parallel two lines like this. Um, towards the normal. So the incident ray is towards the normal. And if you notice, the angle of incidence is greater than the angle of refraction. Now once it's in, it then goes uh, away starts to move away from the normal as it emerges. Now what you have here is the angle of refraction is now less or more, yeah, less than the angle of um, incidence as it leaves. Now why is this important? Well, because we talk about electromagnetic spectrum, but it certainly, uh, we'll go back to that as I talk about certain kinds of waves in the spectrum here now. Uh, more importantly, when we talk about microwaves and why we use those as opposed to radio waves when we're talking about satellites. And it goes back to reflection and refraction in that case. So, what kind of things could they ask? Um, different types of, you might have to actually fill gaps on electric. Okay. Yep, you're back. Back? Okay. Um, yeah, remember my instructions, visible under x-ray goggles. All right, so just a matter of knowing. Sometimes they'll leave gaps and they'll get you to fill them in. Um, radio waves having the largest wavelength, um, and it goes all the way down to the smallest wavelength being gamma rays. Okay, so it goes one to the other, but gamma rays would have the higher frequency, okay, and radio waves would have the smaller frequencies. Yeah, okay. Part seven. <laughs> <laughs>
in this probably 12 part series here tonight. Um, okay, I was talking about electromagnetic spectrum. I was just looking that way for it to cut out again. So, properties, electromagnetic waves, they're transverse. Okay, they travel the same speed in a vacuum and they all transfer energy. Okay, so there's three things that they all do. This whole spectrum has those properties. A few things, microwaves. So microwaves can transfer data to mobile, mobile phones. Um, an electric, um, yeah, so, right. Waves transfer, <laughs> waves transfer data. So things like microwaves is actually what your mobile phones use to transfer data. Uh, next one, electric fire transfers energy to our bodies and it's via infrared. So infrared waves, that's how the, the uh, fire, electric fire transfers that energy to us. Some energy from the sun is transferred by UV, so ultraviolet. Um, obviously tanning beds use ultraviolet as well. And we can actually uh, synthesize um, or do use ultraviolet light on plants and so on if you want to help them grow. Um, not all energy from an x-ray machine is transferred. This is quite interesting. Some of it is absorbed, um, and that's why it produces the image. So we would shine the x-ray at your hand, say if I broke my arm, it would go through all the soft tissue, but the bones would absorb those x-rays. So that's why the picture comes up with just the bone showing, and you can see the break. Um, and energy from radioactive sources can be transferred by gamma rays. Okay, So radioactive sources will often give off gamma rays. Um, so why do I talk about this kind of stuff in the wavelength? Um, some of the things they can ask you, I'll just pick a couple. One is uh, with microwaves, okay? So the amount of any wave that is reflected or transmitted or absorbed depends on its wavelength, okay? So if we went back to the electromagnetic spectrum, radio waves have quite long wavelengths, then it comes smaller to microwaves and so on. So when we're talking about satellites that orbit our Earth, we can't use radio waves, okay? Because the radio waves are often, because of their size, reflected back, okay? Reflected back by our outer atmosphere, um, or some of it is actually absorbed in the gases that are in our atmosphere. So the waves actually won't make it out to the satellites. However, as we get down, the microwaves, which can still transfer data, they can make it all the way out of our atmosphere, most of it, and reach the um, satellites. Now, likewise, on the way back in, as the satellites try to send the data back, you have to understand that um, they can get refracted on their way back in. Uh, something I do want to touch on, and I am going to go back now because I actually just remember, they sometimes like to give you a diagram where they'll give you like a semicircle, okay? And so you'll have your normal line, and they'll have you showing your angle of incidence, and it, and it's going to refract. So this could be a glass semicircle. So it will refract and slow down. But what's interesting is where it's a semicircle. Every single one, any, any, no matter where it hits, it's still going to be 90 degrees. So it's going to be hitting at a 90 degree angle. So it's just going to continue on its normal path. So I just remember that when I was thinking about uh, microwaves and our satellites sending information back in. It just came to my mind. So be aware of that. It's something you should take note of. Touched on that. Um, radiation. So infrared and infrared radiation. This method of heat transfer, it can take place in a vacuum because it is electromagnetic wave, so it can move through a vacuum. Um, it's emitted and absorbed by all objects. Okay, so every object you can think of is actually giving off or absorbing some sort of infrared radiation. The hotter the object, the more that's going to be emitted. And to increase the rate of infrared radiation emittance or absorption, or absorption um, you make the object black and you make it matte, so not shiny, so a matte black surface and obviously the bigger surface area would increase absorption or emit it. So we're looking for black, not shiny, will we'll absorb the most radiation but will also emit the most radiation. And that's going to lead us into an actual um, 
rapport practical to get you to think about. But I'm going to draw this one out. I see you have a little diagram here with me. Okay, so I'm going to use the whiteboard underneath. And we're going to draw something that we call a Leslie cube. Okay, so you, you might have done this, you might have heard about it, but similar to what I have up here, but I'm actually going to draw the Leslie cube and we're going to talk about that because it is a, um, one of the key points. So let's see if I can draw my cube. Okay, it's not the best cube, but it's my cube, so I love it. Um, you got a little top here where this is where you're going to put some, okay, so the boiling water. We would fill this cube up with boiling water. And each side of this cube, we're going to give it a different surface. Alright, so maybe this surface will be matte black. This side that you see in here will be maybe shiny black. This front surface here will be shiny silver. Shiny silver, and in the back side could possibly be white. So now we have four different surfaces here. What do we do next? We fill it in with boiling water. So what temperature does water boil at? Well, it's 100 degrees. So that's going to kind of be our measuring point. But what we're going to have is this, this thing called um, an infrared sensor. Pose. Okay, I'm back. Oh, caught me in my power pose. Um, <laughs> yeah, back to the Leslie Q. Um, where was it? Yeah, so it's not the only way you might see this, okay? So this is the idea. This is the Leslie Q. This is the idea. Obviously, the one I got here is a triangle, okay? Or a prism, you would call it, I guess. And then uh, another way that I read is if we got... You had four test tubes. And maybe we painted them different... Colors. So we were painting. All right. Yeah. Try again. Back. Okay. I do apologize, um, but um, thanks to the to the technical team here, we're getting it rolling. Okay. So we're getting it going. Um, yeah. The other way you can see this: four test tubes. You can paint them different uh, colors, maybe black, uh, some white, some red. Um, Use a kettle, thermometer to check the temperatures, and then obviously the infrared detector. Again, you can test the different colors. Now at this point, um, we're going to be moving on to electric motors, and I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Cave, um, who's going to teach you this part and probably fill in possibly any gaps that you might need to know. All right, so give him a round of applause, all of you at home. <laughs> right, thanks guys. Uh, yeah, really sorry about all the disruptions we've had tonight. Uh, we've tried to power through. Obviously, it's important you've got your exams tomorrow, so there's no way we can do this at another time. Uh, but for whatever reason, the internet's being jammed up. Uh, I'm blaming it on the World Cup, as amazing as that tournament is. Uh, like I say, I think, I think that streaming and all those people streaming things on the World Cup, I appreciate the game's finished now, but uh, it's causing us to cut out and lose the feed. Um, and I just want to finish this bit on electric motors. Not sure, just checking that we are still we are still there, we still got it, okay, we're still there. So, like I say, we'll, we'll power on through, uh, we'll get through this last bit because it's a real key bit. Um, it's kind of, I believe, probably the, the, the toughest bit um, in, this, in this unit, in P2, uh, electric motors, Fleming's left hand rule, uh, things like that. Um, so, a few things, uh, first of all, do you want to slide up the Fleming's left hand rule, which I'll get out of the way and I'll come to and I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and also what is caused the, the motor effect, what causes that. But an important bit uh, you need to be able to talk about, the basics of uh, magnetism is you need to know, and I'm sure you do, that the opposite poles uh, attract each other and like poles repel. Which means if uh, you have two uh, poles that are <coughs> north, so if you put two north poles uh, next to each other, uh, you need to... Uh, they will repel each other, whereas a north and a south pole will uh, go against. 
Uh, if you want to block the, the glare out, what you need to do is look at the shadow over there on the window and make sure it's blocking the iPad. Uh, just getting my uh, technical support team, just getting them bang to rights there, making sure they're doing their job uh, as I was doing effectively earlier. Um, so, uh, so, with magnets, you've got two like poles, uh, put them near each other, so that means a north pole and a north pole, uh, and they repel, uh, because like poles repel. Whereas opposite poles will attract, so opposite poles uh, attract each other. Uh, an example of that would be, I'm uh, just going to sort of put it onto this board, and we have run out of uh, paper as well, uh, which causes us to have a problem uh, right on this board, so we have to write on here, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get the gist of it. I know there is some glare on here as well, um, because we don't have anything we can uh, write more on. So, full of technical difficulties tonight. Funnily enough, it's our last one. you think it would be practised by this point, but it turns out to be our, our poorest attempt at it. Uh, but hopefully you're getting the key information, which is the crucial bit. So, as I say, basic magnets. Uh, if you put a north pole of a magnet next to uh, another north pole, they will create a force, but that force will be one of repulsion. They will repel each other. They will push away. Whereas if you put uh, a north pole and a south pole of a magnet, they will attract, their force will be one of attraction. Similarly, if you put two south poles uh, together, they would repel as well. So like poles uh, repel and opposite poles attract. So that's the first sort of bit uh, about magnets, the basics really. Then you need to know about magnetic fields. Now magnetic fields, um, you need to be able to plot a magnetic field around the magnet. You can do this with a plotting compass, and they could ask you about how you did it. Uh, so essentially, if you take a bar magnet, which has a north and south pole uh, either side, usually they're coloured, like one's coloured uh, blue and one's coloured uh, red. So you've got a red side to the magnet and you have a blue side uh, to the magnet. Uh, if you were to place a pl plotting compass, which is one of those tiny little compass uh, that, that points towards the, the North Pole normally, if you put it uh, around this, it would actually uh, line up and you would actually be able to trace the magnetic field lines. And they would look like this. They would come out of the North Pole and they always go into the South. They would do the same the other side. Um, they would go out North and into the South. 